Good evening, everybody. It is a warm summer night in July, and we are together. Amen. Welcome, everybody, to the first edition of our summer series, Framing Family Life. And Brother Myers is going to be our initial speaker to start off this series tonight, and he'll give us some insight uh, into what we're going to cover during this summer series. It's just so good to see everyone out tonight, and I uh, hope that you will enjoy uh, what has been planned. It's very, uh, how do you say, educational, uh, very challenging for us, and I'm sure that you'll be able to glean things that will be able to help you as you live this Christian life. So we're going to have a couple of verses of a song uh, from Brother Bradshaw. And then we're going to be led in prayer by Brother Richard Robinson. And after that, Brother Myers will take over. Amen. Uh, since I was put on the spot, I don't have a, a plethora of songs. But we're going to sing, uh, I love to praise him. 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 You know that I love to praise his holy name for he's my rock, he's my rock, my rock, my rock, my sword and shield, and he's the wheel, he's the in the middle, in the middle of the wheel, said I know he'll never, he'll never, say he won't never let me down, he's just the joy, oh Lord that I have found, let's sing hallelujah, hallelujah, I said I love to praise his Yes, sing hallelujah, hallelujah, yeah, I said I love to praise his name. Keep singing hallelujah, hallelujah, well, I said that I love to praise his name. You know that I love to praise his holy name. Let us pray. Gracious Lord and loving Father, we are blessed again to be in your presence. Uh, we gather here uh, this Wednesday as uh, members of the body of Christ for the purposes of edifying and building, being built up by the messages we're going to hear this evening. Kind Father, we thank you for watching over us all this week and granted us safe uh, travel to this place. Uh, we pray that you be with our members who are unable to be with us this evening. I hope and prayer that they'll be able to look in on the, the, the gathering this evening and the message that we will receive. Kind Father, we are most thankful for your Son and our Lord and Savior, and we pray in his name that uh, any sins that uh, stand between us and uh, our Father in heaven might be forgiven. We give thanks for your Son and our Savior who made all things possible. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Great to see everybody tonight. Uh, truly, it's been a pleasure. I cannot believe that the summer series is already here. It seemed like we were just opening up Christmas presents, but uh, <laughs> but uh, here, here we are. You know, one of the things that has, has happened, we as a family, uh, there are all kinds of challenges that go on on a daily, weekly basis. And what's so unique is that for those of us who are in Christ, not only do we have our family family, our biological family, and we make all the adjustments and whatnot for that, uh, but we also have this spiritual family. Uh, sometimes it's uh, different. Uh, we might not be used to using that word father in a very uh, connecting type manner because maybe we grew up without a father. Uh, we, in, 
uh, in the church, we talk about how we honor one another. Uh, maybe I grew up or come out of a family that didn't honor one another. And so there are some adjustments. And I think what Jesus has done, really, as we talk about this, this concept of family, really helps us to see that, you know, the family that we have in Christ is the, is the perfect example of family. All of us coming from all kinds of varied backgrounds and whatnot, but it's only in Christ that we see the Father as who the Father should be. And many of us try to emulate him, but oftentimes we find out that we fall short. But the bottom line of it is that we have these family connections, and that's what we want to focus in on, on this particular summer series. Uh, you, you know uh, by now that you know, we are going to be here with uh, we're going to be streaming, and so if you have someone that, uh, it sounds like I'm getting a feedback here, I want to make sure that it's not too loud for you guys. Uh, but we want to make sure that we are able to invite people that, you know, think would be helpful with this. Uh, we are talking about framing family life. Uh, we are living in a time right now that, boy, it's almost anything goes. You know, I'm still getting used to the concept of uh, our, our young basketball player, uh, Griner, uh, is, is wanting to send a letter to her wife. Uh, that, that's, that, that's a challenge there. That really is. Because we uh, are, are now have legalized so much with our, with our court systems and whatnot. And even with the idea of, of trying to frame the family in a way that's acceptable to the Lord. And, and, and how it can be helpful to us and to our children. And so there are some challenges. And so we're talking about the idea of, of framing family life, presenting it at a way, in a way that God has intended, where solutions and helps and encouragement and all those kinds of things can take place. This particular lesson that I want to share tonight had an impetus with the, uh, I received an invitation from the Dallas Fort Worth Biolo uh, Biological Behavioral Service. It was, it was biological, uh, getting there. Uh, but it was about veterans, and the focus was on trauma. Uh, you know that I'm, I'm a vet, uh, four years in the Air Force. Uh, we had some suicides while I was in the service, and we had some, uh, some Dear John letters coming in. We had all kinds of things that generate trauma. And so they asked me to come over and speak and talk about some of the aspects of trauma. And as a result of that, you know, I thought, you know, what I'm sharing here, I think would be helpful for us as well. Uh, because, you know, we are Christians, but we're also human. And a lot of the trauma challenges that we go through uh, it's, it's in this world, and in this world there are tough times and there's heartaches and pain and all of that. And so the essence of what we're wanting to talk about tonight, introducing the series, if you will, this idea of how do we frame, how do we handle anger, how do we handle those things that just keep cropping up in our lives? How do we deal tonight with this thing called trauma? Uh, I think I'm... Okay, there we go. And so, so we're looking at the idea of, of one of the passages that you might have read over this several times and not even thought about it, and that is the idea of, of in Ezra chapter 3. We, we see in verse 12 there were some wonderful things that were happening, but as a result of that, uh, there was some sadness happening. Uh, when the, when the altar was uh, reinstalled and when, when there was a great accomplishment, if you will, so far as the building of God's people's place again, the young folks shouted and they were so happy. And they were just thrilled to death and they, they were just, just, just giving glory to the Lord. But that passage says in the very midst of that, uh, there were some folk that were crying. Those are the ones that remember what the original place looked like. And so sometimes trauma, sadness, challenge can be in the midst of everybody else is happy. Uh, yeah, I remember, I think, was it, uh, was it Smokey Robinson that sung the song, The Tears of a Clown? You know, yeah, okay, all right. Uh, so you, you begin to see this clown walk in and he has a painted face, but you can't explain the tears. And I think that's some of our lives. Uh, things seem to be going well on the outside, but there are some things that are happening on the inside that are absolutely overwhelming. So tonight we're talking about the idea of the generation. I think I might be one step too far, here, too far here. Let me. Well, let's see. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think that's it. I think that's it. Uh, the generational challenge, if you will, of trauma 
and also the triggers of trauma. Some of the things that I thought was so interesting in, in, in working with the, uh, the, the group of therapists, by the way, was this idea of trying to understand the triggers that you and I might engage or might experience. Uh, and one thing, and I want to make sure I say this before we get, get any further, all of us have experiences. All of us have gone through stuff. What happens the way God designed us, the way he made us, is that we have this innate ability to protect ourselves, to, to, to guard ourselves. And you think I'm kidding, uh, find a newborn babe and, and, and put something over the baby's face. I mean, make sure you get the parents' permission, okay? Uh, and, and watch what that two-week-old, two-month-old baby will do. They will take it off, they'll fight against it. You didn't train them to do that. It's, it's built in. It's, 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 it's something that we automatically do because of this idea of taking care of ourselves. Uh, how many of us had uh, those newborn babes and, and you got on your Sunday go to meeting clothes and they get hungry? And I don't care if that, that dress is uh, you know, uh, a Kardashian dress or, or a Walmart dress, uh, they, they're wanting to eat. Uh, you didn't train them that, they will do that. It's innate, it's something that we automatically do. And as a result of that, when we have bad experiences, when, when things have happened, be it abuse, be it uh, accidents, be it whatever the case might be, you and I have built up a protection system. Many of us are experienced guys that come back from the war, and as a result of that, they're used to explosions and all of that. Can you imagine somebody coming from Ukraine right about now? And all of a sudden, uh, during the 4th of July, when the celebration happened, you know, can you imagine what they're going through? They're not in a war zone. They're in Dallas, Texas. They're, they're uh, it's safe here. But those triggers happen, and they become real in that person's experience. Many of us in Christ, we, uh, as we share our faith, as we work with individuals, sometimes it's hard for us to understand some of the trauma or the triggers of those traumas that individuals that we're talking with have experienced. Uh, and that's, that's something we'll be talking about tonight. And so uh, trauma with the idea, if I can get down to, I'm trying to do two things here. So it, yeah, if, I, if I drive off the road, uh, hold on, I'm coming back. Uh, so trauma and the Christian. Uh, this is a perspective of trauma with believers. If you're in Christ, there's this mindset that everything is fine. And it is fine so far as our eternity is concerned. It is fine so far as our salvation is concerned. But you and I have trauma. You and I have things that we experienced in the past that are still here present with us right now. And as a result of that, sometimes when I uh, think I'm, uh, I should be really happy and full of joy, but I feel overwhelmed, I feel as if I'm in a cloud. And sometimes they might question, I might question my very Christianity because we should be happy in Christ, everything should be fine, but the reality of it is sometimes it's hurting. And so our brother James Wright, and I, we're in a new series now in the book of James, he says, count it all joy. My brothers, when you meet trials and various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its perfect effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. It is God alone that can take all the tough experiences that you and I have and turn them into things that will benefit us. That to me is one of the most amazing things about being a Christian. It doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter what your background is. If you trust yourself to the Lord, trust yourself to his word, it's amazing what God can do with all of those black eyes, if you will, all of those hurts, all of those things that we've experienced. And we will be growing, if you will, as opposed to being destroyed. Only God can do that. There is no blame game in, in Christ. It is individual journeys with God through the stuff that we've gone through. And so dealing with that tonight, we're looking at the idea of what can we do, what must we do as we work through this particular uh, experience. Jesus says in Matthew 20, verse 19, <clears throat> excuse me, go into all the world and therefore teach, and watch the latter part of that, all nations. 
You know, you don't have to be a, 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 a mathematician, but you know that if you're going to teach all nations, you're going to have to deal with languages, culture, experiences, all of those kinds of things. And so watch what Jesus says here in, 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 in Matthew chapter 13, about eight different things he likens, if you will, the church to, the kingdom to. It might be a sore in chapter 13, verse 3. The idea of, of the word being broadcast, that's, that's one way the kingdom is like. But verse 24 talks about how there's a, 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 a good man sowing, a man sowing good seed. That's the kingdom. There's a, a, a grain of mustard seed, how something so small can have such a profound impact. There's a leaven, a little yeast, and all of a sudden the, the need of bread is affected, contaminated with the energy of the yeast. There's a treasure that's it. All of these are descriptions, Jesus says, that the kingdom of heaven is like. As you go among all the nations, as you go into all the world and preach and teach the gospel, uh, let me tell you what the kingdom is like, what you're going to experience. There's a merchant man, chapter 13, verse 45. And there's a householder, chapter 13 and verse 52. But one I want to focus in on is that one in verse 47. Listen to what, what, what was said. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind. When it was filled, they drew it to the beach and they began to sit down and, and take out the good and throw away the bad. That is a wonderful illustration of how we are in the kingdom of God is all about. A net has been thrown out. And all of a sudden you bring in perch, you bring in uh, all kinds of wonderful fish. Maybe there's a buffalo in there, maybe there's uh, some catfish, or, but there's also some gars and some, maybe a couple of snakes that will you know, get in there. Uh, but the idea is that the net goes out and all of us are part of that net. All of us have been brought in. All of us have relinquished our power and give it to, to the Lord. But what that means is you and I are so different. And yet there's something that should pull us closer together. And that is the idea of the Lord and his will for our lives. And so we talk about this idea of, 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 of trauma. We talk about the idea of, of challenges as we look at us together. What is trauma? From a psychological perspective, okay, uh, trauma is the unique individual experience of an event. A series of events or a set of enduring conditions in which the individual's ability to integrate his or her emotional experience is overwhelmed. The individual experiences subjectively a threat to life, uh, bodily, uh, uh, yeah, uh, the, whatever the word is, or sanctity. Yeah, you have been there when you see something, you just, it won't just come out. Uh, trauma defined, watch this, is relative. What is traumatic depends upon your or our vulnerability. And because children are so dependent on their caretakers and survival uh, and, and safety, they are vulnerable to traumatization by watch all of these things that are, I think we have a child care center here. We might, we might experience some of this. Even the children that are young in this congregation. Frightened and being frightened by something like a caregiver. Maybe the voice is too strong, maybe the voice is, whatever the case might be, that can be a traumatic experience in our lives, especially in our children's lives. Neglect, separation, abandonment. Uh, how many young children have gone through parents divorcing? That's a traumatic experience because children look at their parents as a foundation upon which they stand. And when mom leaves or when dad leaves, that foundation has been upended. That could be traumatic for this child. Exposure to domestic violence. These are people, when we throw that net out, we're gonna bring people in. All of this traumatic experience is something you and I need to be aware of, it. not only in our own lives, but also in the lives of people that we are influencing for the Christ. 
parental fighting, uh, uh, threatening words, secondary effect of uh, uh, people come back from the war zone, they have their own post-traumatic stress, but then they come back and sometimes that post-traumatic stress is passed on to our children. And that's something that we need to be aware of. Accidents, medical crisis, surgery, and invasive procedures, the death of a parent or a parent figure. We're just now beginning to fully not fully, but helpful to understand some of the things that happen when we lose a parent. Uh, that, that foundation, that security is gone now, traumatic experience. Uh, I'm sure everybody has heard about what has happened up in uh, uh, Lake Highland in, in Chicago, or well, outside Chicago. Uh, one of the richest communities in the country. Uh, you know, you know, when I first heard the news, I said, I think I've heard of Lake Highland. I don't know if I've ever driven through, they wouldn't even let me probably. but. But can you imagine the traumatic experience? I saw one case out of all the seven people that were killed and the 30 or so that was wounded after 70 rounds were fired. There was a young girl that was running in the face of a mother being shot and killed. I wonder what that's going to be like when she places her membership or somebody, one of us baptize her into Christ. I think there's going to be some trauma. And so, so maybe when she sees somebody else hugging their parent, especially their mom, that might be a flashback, that might be a trigger for her, and she doesn't understand the overwhelming sadness that might take place. I'm talking about the effects of trauma. Sometimes I don't realize that that trigger is within me until something happens. And that would be the case with this young girl. Uh, Trauma is also about the idea of in, in engaging, if you will, our uh, survival skills. There's a couple of quotes I might have shared it in the past. Uh, someone wrote that our survival skills will outlive all of us. And one of the greatest examples of this to me is when you talk to somebody who lived through the depression. It's amazing, one of our shepherds, <laughs> uh, He's an expert in this. Uh, it, it's just that we, we tease him about how he hold on to the, to the dollar grins. And, <laughs> but look at where he come from. Some of us that grew up in Chicago and other places, you know, uh, in Chicago, there's still sweetness out of sugar. And, and so what you do, you, you put your car, if you're fortunate to get a garage, you put your car in there and you lock it in the garage. <laughs> That, that's, was it trauma? Have you ever walked in your house or apartment and see somebody walking out of it? Traumatic, traumatic. And so the idea, have you ever had an accident on this particular street? And as you get on that street again, all of a sudden there's, uh, the heart starts racing. What is that about? That's a trigger. You're not, you're not in an accident uh, situation, you, you, but that trigger, that experience is there and that thing becomes just as real as the accident itself, the triggers of trauma. Empathy is the ability to feel another's experience, but the next part of that is respect, is the ability to value another's experience. We in the kingdom of God, as we throw that net out and bring people in, if you will, understand the fact that whoever we're bringing in here will have their own situation, their own troubles, their own trials, their own trauma. And it just helps us to be a little bit more appreciative, maybe open the door to our own trauma experience, but also work with those individuals that we bring into Christ and, 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 and share their thoughts with, of the Lord with them. Um, I think it's Frederick uh, Nietzsche uh, says something that always captured my attention. He says, be careful in throwing out the demons. And this is just a they might contain something of value. I used that thought in my mind growing up in Chicago. You know, in Chicago, you, you have to constantly be aware of what's around you. Right, right, Frank? <laughs> and so, so as you walk down the street, you already are thinking about your exit strategy. You know, that's, you know, you live in a nice neighborhood now, safe area and whatnot, but don't throw that demon out. Because just in case something happens, you already are trained as to what to do. 
That's the idea. That's those survival skills that we have integrated in our lives because of the experience that we've had in the past. A lot of our children come into this world or come into the classroom or come into our church classes and whatnot. They have experiences. And sometimes little Johnny, little Mary might not cooperate. It might be because it's a traumatic experience. All oh, you guys hug each other. Hmm. I remember years ago at a church, I don't think we do it that much now, but uh, you say, okay, everybody hold hand when you pray. That's hard for me. That is really hard. I mean, I'm, I don't want to squeeze too hard, but I'm, I'm, my mind is not on praying at all. My mind is mixed up. You know. <laughs> it probably goes back to my mom. Uh, uh, when he and one of my siblings will get into it, she'll make us hug. Uh, is you have a mother, a mother like that? <laughs> Y'all love each other. Hug and we we'll hug and I'm gonna kill you. <laughs> but, you but we obey mama. <laughs> triggers, triggers. I've done a lot of funerals in, in my life. But one of the things that really uh, is a trigger for me is when I have to preach to a, 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 a eulogy for a young child, a baby. A trigger comes in because of the fact that we buried our child uh, so many years ago. And so what I'm saying, you might not even be aware of it, but all of a sudden you might feel this tremendous weight upon you and you don't know where it's coming from. That's a trigger. The trigger is not real, but the trigger represents something that is real. And so again, just having knowledge of that within my own life as well as uh, with one another, we wanna be aware of that. So if that's the case, and if we're to bear one another's burdens, wouldn't it be wonderful to kind of be able to entrust one another to share some of the things that we really struggle with? I'm not that you couldn't find a parking spot out on the you know, parking. I mean, that's, that's, that might be traumatic, especially if you're running late. But wouldn't it be wonderful if we had an environment where we could share those kinds of triggers? Those that have come back from the war, those that have suffered uh, you know, horrendous things in this life. Wouldn't it be wonderful to have a, have a place for us to lean on one another and to experience the hurt, the pain with one another, to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law. And so when we look at this, this idea of trauma, the triggers of, uh, of trauma, the human body is self-protective. Uh, it automatically reacts to any cue indicating the possibility of danger. You know, sometimes if you even take your own hand and do that, you, you, you close your eyes. You're not going to hit yourself in the face. It's so innate. I'm going to protect myself. And so we say we want to get close to one another. Yeah, yeah. And we, we all are going to automatically automatically. Uh, before the, the, the message is over, I'm out the back door because I, I just, uh, I'm uncomfortable uh, being connected to someone else. It, it's, it's traumatic when I don't understand that. Well, if you kind of walk with them for a little bit, maybe you will be a little bit more understanding of it. And that's where triggers can come in. The brain is biased to respond to any danger signal it has known before. If you've been hurt over here, and if all of a sudden that environment is that way again, it can easily be traumatic for you. Uh, some, sometimes, you know, when you uh, walk into a room, you, you declare that I've been here before. Maybe it's because the walls are the same color as once before, then you had this horrific experience or whatever the experience was. You can just declare that I, I've been here before. I, I, I've lived through this moment. And Satan can really play with that. He say, well, you know, uh, I'm, I'm the one that's providing it for you. You need to trust me and not the Lord. You know, so, you no, know, you haven't been there before. But maybe that experience is somewhere in your life. Does that make sense? And so uh, times of the day can be a trigger. The idea of, of uh, uh, time of the year. Uh, used to be October was a tough time for me because we lost our mom in October. Hmm, that's kind of 
coincidental, isn't it? So you take this little kid from a little rinky-dink southern town, and he goes to the south side of Chicago. We're talking about the experiences, and that self-protectedness is what you and I have to be aware of as we reach out and try to connect to one another. I might give you a stiff arm, because for me, that's traumatic, you're even trying to get close to me. That's the idea. And when you uh, share that out, we talk about intimacy between uh, uh, married folk or the idea of closeness of brothers and sisters. Sometimes that can be very traumatic because my experience has been I was taken advantage of. I was hurt. And as a result of that, they're not just standoffish. It's that it's a danger for them. You and I need to be aware of that as we begin and, and continue to embrace one another. Facial expression, color, smell, sounds, weather condition, a tone of voice, or body language, touch, even our own emotions and body uh, sensations. When we are triggered, we experience certain, sudden and overwhelming feelings, uh, sensations, and impulses that convey, I am in danger right now. Not last week or the week before, but right now. That's how the triggers work. And as a result of that, if we are not cognizant of that, you and I are going to be the victims of it. And you and I will try to protect ourselves when there's no real need to protect. There's no danger here. But again, I can't get close to you because, you know, I've got some trauma going on here, some triggers going on. A uh, couple of thoughts here. This was put a uh, uh, Dr. Uh, <clears throat> Janina, uh, I forget her last name, Fisher, I think it is, uh, had a, a book. And she did a lot of work on triggers. And so now, this original list came from uh, the presentation with, the, with, with this group of therapists. And so when you look at the, <laughs> when you look at the actual thing that, that, that's at the top of the list here is therapy and therapist. So, so, so it's like, OK, uh, what's that about? Uh, maybe when you and I put it into our context, hey, I, I want to talk to you. I want to you know, get to know you better. I, sometimes just you inquiring into my world can be traumatic. One of the greatest fears us humans have, and that is the fear of rejection. And so as a result of that, I'm going to protect myself. Yeah, well, that might affect us in our care group gets together, our service group get togethers, our, our uh, times together, eating together, whatever the case. Well, maybe I'm, I'm always busy. I'm always busy. Uh, being asked questions, self disclosure, being put on the spot, being a center of attention, loud noises, uh, authority figures, being told no, some, uh, having to say yes. I mean, <laughs> Us humans are very, very complicated. We're very complicated. And what's so interesting also is that you can take two people from the same home. One will be traumatized by an event, and the other one will not. It becomes to be, it begins to be a very individual situation. And so, so maybe that helps us to understand the idea of, of you know, be, be slow to anger. Yeah, the idea of loving each other in a way that I'm not going to, I'm not going to, uh, not, you don't owe me anything. My, my goal is to love you. My goal is to, that, that word agape or agapao is the idea of I'm going to seek your good, period. Because I know that we have all these things going on in the background. Wouldn't it be wonderful in the kingdom of God to have its members connected to this idea, I'm going to love you. I'm going to seek as much as life within me. I will be there with you. I'll walk with you. Uh, confrontation, eye contact, nighttime, you name it. I tell you what, every doggone thing we can do can be traumatic. Triggered reactions, some things here that, uh, that, that can be affecting. These are sudden, these are intense, and these are hard to shift. Anxiety, fear. Have you ever been afraid? We had a sister, I, I, I don't think she's here tonight, but uh, she, we were talking one time and, and she had this great fear of going across bridges. So, you know, that's kind of tough. Uh, have you ever been to uh, New Orleans and, and drove over that punch a train? 
That bridge is about three days long. <laughs> can you imagine? Can you imagine? If you got kinfolk down there, <laughs> yeah, they, they might be kind of on the other side because I'm not going to go see you. A lot of these high rises around here get my attention. Yeah, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm glad the Lord is going to send angels to, to, uh, to, to bring me the. Some of these high rises, I mean, uh, you're about 20 stories and you're looking in somebody's office. I mean, it's, and, and you're trying to drive and, and somebody's on your bumper going, you know, come on, guy, you know. <laughs> Traumatic experience, trauma. Uh, taken off in an airplane. Uh, we was flying back from Chicago there about, about a couple of months ago. A young lady sat down, it was a late flight. I sit on the end, and she, the seat in between them was empty and she sat by the window. The whole plane is packed. And all of a sudden, well, we come into a love field to, to land. And boy, I tell you what, it looked like the Lord just, you know, he'd yawn and go, and, and the wind. <laughs> she was sitting over there by herself, not, not minding. You know, I'm dozing off reading or whatever. Next thing I know, this, this <laughs> had a death grip on me and wouldn't let go. And, and the plane is just, and I'm going, okay, now. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to navigate, got somebody squeezing my hand and the, does the pilot, pilot need me to go help him fly this plane? And then so after, after we smoothed out again, she apologized profusely. I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. I said, that's all right, it, it got all of our attention, you know. And all of a sudden, it looked like the pilot was listening. So he did it again. <laughs> triggers, triggers, fear, fear. But we're told that perfect love casts out fear. And so at the bottom of all of this is that God loves us and we love one another. And as a result, of, uh, no matter what's going on, you and I can be there for one another and with an understanding of one another. Uh, thinking of a time we were flying out to LA and a young, uh, uh, we had a flight out and all of a sudden there was a, uh, an incident on the plane. A guy had a heart attack, they laid him out in the middle of the aisle this nurse sat in front of us. And so she, they said, anybody here, nurse, medical background? So she jumped up, went down the aisle, and boy, she's just working on this guy. He, he survived. She comes back, sat in front of us, and all of a sudden, it starts, uh, not, what is it, raining, lightning? <laughs> all of a sudden, look between the seat in front of us, this uh, person was looking back at us. Had never seen her before. And she said, uh, do you all mind if I sit between you all? <laughs> I mean, you were 40,000 feet in the air. Sure. And so I, I unbuckled my belt to get up, but I didn't need them. She came across the seat, <laughs> sat between us. If she walked in the door now, I would not, I would not recognize her. Here's somebody that just saved somebody's life. And all of a sudden, we're up in there with all the storms going on. And she was scared to death. Hmm, interesting. Us humans, we function a lot out of the experiences that we've had. I don't know her story. All I know is that that fear, that anxiety was there for her. And I was thankful to the Lord that my wife and I were there to be there for her as we went through that roller coaster in a jet plane. It increases heart rate. Uh, the idea, it can cause a pit in our stomach, tightness, clenching in our stomach, because these emotions, they just kind of seize us, but they're based on something that happened in the past, an experience I, I might not even be fully aware of, but it still has an effect upon me. Why, why do you like, I talked to a, uh, Dr. Uh, Lee, I, I forget his last name, it was there, Saturn Road. And we're talking about, there was some new research that had come out, talked about the idea of, we typically think that our body's sensors are in our brain. But more and more research is indicating now that sensors are in place throughout our bodies. And what that means is, is if you have a transplant, that transplant liver, heart, or whatever the case might be, is a part of the person that you are getting it from. And so as a result of that, uh, Lee was saying, that, you know, he said, before I had my liver transplant, I, he, I, didn't, I didn't think he liked broccoli or something. He said, but I can't get enough of it. A little research indicates that the person he got the liver from liked that. 
I'm telling you, when the Bible talks about how we're wonderfully made, yeah. God did that in one verse, boom, we're here, and we're so complicated. We need to know that when we're interacting with one another. I don't know what your trauma is, what, the tr what might trigger it. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we can create the kind of environment so that we can talk about it, so that we can love one another? Uh, shallow breathing, hyperventilation, holding the breath, uh, uh, obs obsessive thinking. If I do that, I might take my, where's it coming from? Maybe there's something in your past, some kind of a traumatic experience that's showing up right now. Uh, respond disproportionately to an event. Major change in previous state. Uh, zero to 60 in a heartbeat. How did you handle conflict growing up? Somebody that we baptize into Christ or that we bring into Christ, how did they handle conflict? Well, normally when we had conflict, one of us, we uh, knocked across the room. And now all of a sudden, that's a traumatic experience. Now you have a difference with your brother, your sister, and they pull back. Because the traumatic experience is, anytime there's a conflict, I'm gonna get knocked across the room. That might be six feet 12 and, and tough and all of that, but that traumatic experience is a part of my life. And I will protect myself as best I possibly can. A few other things, we're coming for a landing. Uh, how can I tell when I'm triggered? I'm doing something I shouldn't do or didn't want to do. Some people, you know, if you're talking to them, they start, Are you all right? Well, I'm fine. How are you? Mm, okay, okay. Muscle tension, either a whole body or specific areas. Us complicated humans. Twitches, ticks, uh, jumping to conclusion. I have a sign in our bathroom that says something. Uh, jump to conclusion is bad exercise. <laughs> uh, jump to a worst case scenario. Uh, I'm going to die. When this happens, I, I know I'm going to die. Okay, okay, all right. Uh, feeling that the sky is falling. Everything is, is, is just overwhelming. What's going on? Maybe we can ask one another, what's happening? Well, you know, maybe a birthday is coming up. Or maybe, whatever the case might be. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we can talk with each other in those kinds of contexts without us having all of these shields and and, and coverings that we have. Sense of not belonging, being on the outside looking in, that can be traumatic. I didn't get selected for the baseball team or the basketball team. And now whenever I'm not selected, it takes me back. And so maybe when you come to church and somebody doesn't speak to you, I'm not make, trying to make us paranoid, I'm just saying that we have different traumatic experiences. So if I see someone standing by themselves, maybe I'll go by and say hi, you know, or you're new here, whatever the case might be, as we reach out to one another. Fear of abandonment, loneliness, and all of those kinds of things. So back to Ezra, Ezra 3, verse 11. But many of the priests and Levites and heads of fathers' houses, the old men that had seen the first house, when the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes, wept with a loud voice. Uh, the latter part of that, and many shouted joy. The same situation. Got half of the group shouting for happiness. And then the old folk that experienced that first house, they're crying. Us humans. You got to love us. You got to love us. This thing is generational in 2 Kings chapter 10, verse 20 or 30. With, with Jehu, uh, he did what was right, and God promises him with the, and now, uh, the taking care of the house of uh, Ahab. Uh, he promises him, thy sons of the fourth generation shall sit on the throne of Israel. In the same context, uh, same uh, idea, look at Deuteronomy 5, verses 9 through 10. Uh, uh, because you are doing what I'm a jealous God, and I'm going to punish upon the third and upon the fourth generation of them that hate me and show loving kindness. So not only do I have my experiences, now it's generational. 
Now it's what my parents have done could affect me, could, could somehow put me in a mindset that I really don't want to be in. But we're all connected to the previous generation. I'm not saying uh, sin, it's talking about if your hair is red, nine times out of two, your mama's or your daddy's was. If you're eight feet tall, I bet you your mom, dad, or somebody is tall in your family. And, and the idea is that we are connected. That makes us that much more complicated because now it's not as simple as these are just my parents. I don't know what happens a generation or two before. Some have said, even with alcoholism, if that uh, grandfather or great-grandfather was an alcoholic, it could take up to four generations before it's finally out of your family line. I need to know that because that maybe will help me to be patient with myself and help me to be patient with somebody else. I'm not saying we support alcohol. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying that we're complex creatures and we want to make sure we're loving one another in a way that's well-pleasing and acceptable in the Lord. And some thoughts in conclusion. When we think about all the things that we've talked about tonight, <clears throat> In this family, in this family of God, in our, even our personal families, be at peace among yourselves. As our brother Paul write to the young church there in Thessalonica, in Thessalonians 5, verse 13. Luke 6, 31, and as you would that men should do to you, do you also to them likewise. Let's, let's do unto others as we want to be. Would it be wonderful if you had a place that you can share your struggles and not read about them out on the internet someplace? Wouldn't it be wonderful? That's called the church. It's called the church. And one of the concerns I really have, brethren, is that a lot of the opportunity for us to connect personally has now been waived with this idea of social media. You got a thousand friends or five thousand friends. No, you don't. <laughs> You're lying to yourself. You ain't got that many friends. You want to get rid of them, just say, hey, somebody give me $10. <laughs> and your account go down to, yeah, anyway. Uh, the idea of making sure that you and I are treating others the way I want to be treated. I want to be in a place, in a family, in a church that is able to bear one another's burdens. I don't want you just to pray for me to find the right parking spot. I mean, that, that would help. But as I go through some struggle, this time of the year, we have a member of this congregation, a certain time of the year, they're just really traumatic. They lost their mom at that particular time. And so, so that's the idea. Uh, be the same mind one with another, as Paul talks to the Roman brethren, Romans 12, 16. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceit. What I find so interesting about this, Paul writes Romans and he writes 1 Corinthians to mixed congregations. Mixed from the standpoint they have all kinds of experiences. Uh, the, the, the church at Corinth, they were taking one another to law. They were, <laughs> they were, they were tough. Uh, the, the Roman brethren, can you think of Rome? How different they were, and yet Paul writes the same epistle. So what you and I have, so far as the gospel is concerned, is sufficient. We, we don't have to get something else. We just have to live what the Lord has told us to do. Uh, Romans 12, 17, you see it there. In 1 Corinthians uh, verse six, uh, chapter 6, verse 11, as such was some of you, oh, but you were washed, but you are sanctified, you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus by the Spirit of our God. That be us. That be us. And how about in 1 Corinthians 8, 13? Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, guess what? I will never eat meat. What a, what a mindset. Paul says, you are more important than what I'm having for dinner. Wouldn't it be wonderful to have a, a family like that? Uh, you know, uh, anyway, we have good friends, unfortunately. I'm getting more and more friends that are veterinary, I mean, vegetarians. You know, that kind of cramps your style, you know. <laughs> but I'm, I'm kind of getting used to it. I'm, I'm trying to love my brethren. <laughs> but, you know, so I eat my hamburger on the side. You know? <laughs> no, I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just, you know. First Corinthians 10, 23, as we're coming for a landing. All things are lawful unto me, Paul says, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be bought, brought 
uh, under the power of N.A. Wow. And I'd like to close with where we started out uh, a couple of weeks ago in the book of James. James says in chapter 1, verses 9 through 10, he says, if you're low, if you're too poor to pay attention, be exalted because God has put you on a high level. And for the rest, if you're rich, be humbled. You know why? You're going to all lose it tomorrow. So no matter where we are in the spectrum, as Christians, if I'm, if I'm poor, you're cool because God has exalted you in Christ. And if you're a legend in your own mind, be careful. Humble yourself because everything that you have can be gone before the sun goes down. And so the, 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 the lesson tonight is really with the idea of helping us to kind of crack the egg here a little bit as we go through this summer series. And I hope it's helpful. I hope that as you and I learn how to work with anger with one another, within ourselves, as we learn about the, the framework of the family, all those kinds of things, I hope and pray that this series will be beneficial as we not become psychologists and psychiatrists, but that how we can love each other better. And we can really make the church something that is very special and something that this world needs extremely much. And that is to have people to love them, to love them. As, as I close, I, I hope and pray that this is the case. Can we have a word of prayer and then maybe we have a song or bring Fred in uh, that we be able to ask God to help us in this particular matter. Father, we thank you so much for Christ. We thank you for his ability to be all things to all people. Father, we want to be like the Christ so bad. And Father, help us as we are not really fully aware of all the things that, that we've experienced. All we know is that we try to protect ourselves. And Father, we know that our brother James writes that if we, if we can't see what you're doing in our lives, help us, Father, to open up our hearts for wisdom to be able to see things how you see things, that in the final analysis will be people that pleases you. We love you so much. And Father, thank you for the, the class tonight. Thank you for the time we have to just share some thoughts. And may it be blessed, Father, that we might love each other more, that we might make the kingdom that much more inviting, if you will, for those that are lost and away from you. We love you beyond measure. In Christ's holy and magnificent name we pray. Amen. Well, friend. Thank you, Brother Myers, for that lesson tonight. Uh, we're grateful. Uh, I was looking at that list of trauma, and I was saying, boy, I messed up. <laughs> and all those songs, can you be triggered by collard greens? I mean, <laughs> but anyway, but uh, we, we appreciate that so much. Ben, if you would, uh, and, and you know, we're family here, so we always allow uh, those who want to respond to the gospel. Uh, if you're here tonight and you've been taught and you understand uh, and you want to be added to the body of Christ, that opportunity is available to you tonight. And so we want to always, always do that when we come together. And we have many uh, who are dealing with a lot of situations and circumstances and uh, just desiring prayer. Uh, we need to know who you are so we can pray for you. And then also uh, we want to remember those who have lost loved ones among us as well. Uh, ben, I'd like for you to, if you would, um, if you've got the summer series lessons, uh, share that with us tonight so we'll know what's coming. And then we'll have a verse of a song. And then I'm going to come back and we'll have some closing announcements. Okay. We, uh, the communication team is in the process of putting a, a flyer together, and you know how they do it, but everything's going to be um, lovely. <laughs> they're so talented. Uh, we are, the, again, the, the actual uh, series is, is called Fr the Fr Framing Family Life. And so we'll have next week, Lord's willing, uh, a piece on the structural framework of family. And our own brother Shelton gives the fourth, we'll, we'll make that presentation. Uh, after that, we'll...
drop, drop down here a little bit. Well, here we go. Uh, then the following week, we have our brother Sidney Fears who will come, uh, dr driven out of Acts chapter 8, verse 4, with the idea of creating conditions for growth in changing environments. That's what we'll talk about. A uh, week after that, our brother Frank Johnson will come to us and talk, especially from Ephesians 4, verse 29, and with the idea of technology in the midst of shifting paradigms. I don't know if you realize it or not, but we're a different world than we were two years ago. Uh, it's, you know, lot, some of us didn't know what Zoom meant, except out on the highway, and now we be, we be, we be Zoomified. <laughs> After that, Brother Charles Page is going to come and uh, let uh, the uh, Psalm, Proverbs 22, 6, the idea of marketing faith to the family, to the home. How do we shift gears in this busy world so that our homes are now inoculated and we're able to grow healthy children in healthy next generation. Brother Gary Cohorn, well, this is kind of a, a, maybe, maybe not because we're still trying to work some things in, but be angry and sin not. Uh, sometimes it's hard to deal with anger. And again, some of it might be because of the triggers. Uh, but, you know, if, if a voice gets raised, I got to raise mine the most. I don't know why, but I just got to. Some, something back there, something back there. Uh, Brother Robbie John, the following week, the new minister at uh, Saturn Road will come, talks of, talking about humility in our walk. As we walk in this family, as we walk in this framework of family, uh, Brother John is going to help us to understand the need for humility in our walk. And finally, Brother Isaac David, who, Davis, who is uh, working with us this year as an intern, working with uh, Brother Patrick. Uh, comfort and encouragement. Uh, this, after all of this, we need to be comforted and encouraged. <laughs> so so that, that would be, that's the layout. Thank you. We're going to uh, bring out our new song. I'm, yeah, we're going to hear it. You're probably going to hear this a lot over this month. But uh, we're going to sing Show Me the Way. <clears throat> show, show me. The way, yeah, Lord said, show, show me, show me the way, hey, say that I'm down. Just a few announcements before we close. Uh, remember that this coming Lord's Day is the beginning of our third quarter. Uh, and the theme, of course, is the power of us united in reasoning. And we'll have a guest speaker, uh, Brother, uh, he's from Cedar Crest. Brother Morrison from Cedar Crest will be with us on this coming Lord's Day. Wasn't Sunday school wonderful this past Lord's Day? And so we look forward to everybody being back in Sunday school. Make it a habit now. A lot of you had it as a habit on Zoom. We need for you to Zoom it here and uh, make, make, make it a habit here as well. Also, we want to remember that on this coming Friday, we'll have two busloads of our young people who will be traveling to the Wolverine State, the great state of Michigan and they will be attending the National Youth Conference. And we want to remember them in prayer that they'll have a safe journey there, uh, that they will be encouraged while they're there, Amen. and that God will bless them with a safe return back home. So we're looking forward to that as well. So if we could, at this time, let's together stand. They're leaving here at 1 o'clock. Is it 1 o'clock in the afternoon? leaving at one o'clock in the afternoon on Friday from here at the building.
Brother Frank, come around and dismiss us, and we'll forgive you for that jersey. <laughs> I was, I was just matching the speaker tonight. You know, he's from Chicago. Wanted to make him feel at home, right? <laughs> make him feel at home. No <laughs> Let us pray. Our Father and God in heaven, we are so humbled to be here tonight, Father, and we are so thankful that you have allowed us to come together. We're thankful for, that you have brought us through this week thus far. We, we pray, Father, that you continue to watch over us, continue to bless us as only you can. We thank you for the message tonight, Father, how we are to just be mindful of and empathetic to one another, not knowing what each of us have been through and how we individually can help as family, Father. And we pray that we would just think on that and try to put it into action in our lives among ourselves and, and with others that we come in contact with. This world would be a better place. Father, we ask that you would watch over us as we leave this place tonight, that you would uh, give us safe passage, Father. Just be with all those that are out on the roads to arrive safely to their destinations. Until we meet at the next appointed time, Father, we lift this prayer up to you in our Lord and Savior Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>